Welcome to my first of four parts talking about the story anthology or short story anthology of Harlan Ellison's Deathbird stories. Now, Harlan Ellison is a prolific writer. He's written hundreds of short stories and he had passed away last year. So he is one of the best guys out there to learn about reading and writing and what makes a story a story. And it's hard to say exactly all the things that make a story a story, but when you have the short story format, you are focusing on very specific elements in an artistic way, of course, but you have to do it. That is, takes between two minutes to two hours, roughly, depending on the size of the story. But you're focusing first on plot, and you barely have enough time for characterization. So Harlan Ellison is kind of a legend at this. He's had about, I think, 16 or so of these things. Um, some of the short stories overlap into other anthologies. He includes them, and they're just fantastic. I have not read them all. Um, and the one that I've read, I've already done a review with Jordan Owen on his channel. I'll link it in the description if you want to learn about all of them in more detail. This first part, I'll be looking at the first five, and they are just fantastic. Now, with anthology stories, they have a theme or an idea that's usually carried on between all of them. Most of the stories are disconnected, meaning they don't, like it's not like chapter one or then events happen later and then chapter 10. It's just the idea that he was progressing with. And some anthologies don't follow a theme at all. It's just a collection of ideas or a collection of stories with no central theme. So in, in Deathbird Stories, the first part explains what he's talking about. What is this idea? And that is the power of belief. And the power of belief is to create gods in this case. And his descriptions in Introduction, Oblations at Alien Altars, he almost sounds like he's sharing a sentiment with Neil Gaiman, or as any fantasy writer would talk about gods and mysticism and, and mythology. So it's kind of like he's... He, He's sharing these ideas, and this is this is way back in the 60s and 70s. This is, this is probably his longest effort to make an anthology or a series of stories and how much time he put into it, what it took to do. And that's why I think it's one of his best. I haven't read them all, can't say, but this is why I'm revisiting it. And I think if you want to be a better writer, you have to read the great works. And this is one of those great works. So the central theme, again, is belief. And if you believe in something so much, it becomes true. In this case, with gods. And he's kind of doing a, a shot at religion in that regard because people believe in things that are not logical, the things that aren't physically there. They have this, you have a belief in something that it's not real, your future, your aspirations, your desires, and you, you are pushing toward that goal. In this case, it's a, it's a literal metaphysical thing. You're, you're creating this thing out of your mind. And in the concept of gods, enough people think things, they are real and they are true. And that is almost prevalent, if not the main idea throughout the story. There are some stories, again, that don't really play with that as much. So you're going to have a lot of contemporary settings and then a lot of supernatural settings, a lot of surreal descriptions. And sometimes the, the line gets blurred. So it's always going to be going from a world of normalcy to a world of becoming or being, and you're, and you're jumping between the two. That's a common theme, too. So let's actually go through the, the first five and see where they lay. I'll just give a brief summary and talk about them. The first one is The Whimper of Whipped Dogs. And this was inspired by the Kitty Genovese murder, uh, I believe it's in New York. And the reason why this is important is because it was observed by a lot of people when this person was attacked, assaulted, and killed. And this is one of the, I think, the quintessential example of what's called the bystander effect in psychology, where you get enough people together in a group in public, and they will not, the more people you have, the, the less chance of someone reacting to that event. So in case of an assault or an attack, uh, the more people, the less people that will actually go in to stop the thing. If they see, if they, you see someone starting to get hurt. Your natural inclination is to go help them, but there's a lot of people, for some reason, we have this 
idea is, oh, it's just, it's all this public display. This is normal. This is not for me to get involved in. And what's happening in the story, he's, he's creating his own version of the Kitty Genovese murder. And he's ascribing it to living within a certain city and believing that this is, this is like a, an offering to the God that is there to protect you. And it's a constant struggle between other gods and other forces in that city to, to have the power. And it's dark and scary. It's really brutal. And Harlan does not hold back. If you know anything about Harlan Ellison and his, his attitude, he's very straightforward and honest and emotional. And boom, he, he knocks you down as quickly as possible. And this, this is probably a good starting point to get into Deathbird stories because it shows you just how brutal and bloody and, and, and poignant his words are. It's a great story. And it introduces you to the concept very well. The next story is a hard science fiction short story, which is very hard to do in the, in the short story style because you have to describe so many things in technology and get them right. It's called Along the Scenic Route. So imagine Death Race 2000 and getting all the details right. Now, Death Race 2000 was a movie in the 70s, I think, where... It was kind of like this this big um, battle royale with cars, and all the cars have like these gadgets, and they could, you know, they have missiles or guns or you know, metal coming out of the wheels to cut other people's wheels. It's this. It's a death race. You're literally in a car, and you're you're shooting up and trying to kill the other dr- drivers as they go. In this case, this is the actual reality of a highway, and it's kind of like a game, and there's an actual police policing system where you're you're in a car and if you want to attack someone as a game you have to first acknowledge the attack or like you sort of kind of like in in fallout 76 where you, you say like, oh are you going to initiate pvp and then and they you call them up and say yes i am and they got the license number and they say yes you're allowed to do so you now have authority to do so and off you go and then you fight in this battle so what ends up happening is this one guy uses this um excuse to get into a fight with someone because they, they cut him off or something. He got so pissed off that he's going to end up using the weapons he's got. And there's all these defensive measures. And this is where science is really important. This is where you understand in a simple science fiction story like this, you can understand why logic and consistency. And if you're doing hard science, why, why science itself and technology have to be clear, have to be explainable, have to be referenced. If you don't have that, the believability of the science fiction drops. This is just on writing alone is, is great to learn about. And it's a fun, it's a gory, it's a crazy, ironic little story that it's, it, it sticks out in my mind just because when I think of Death Race, this is immediately what I think of. So if you think of Mad Max in the, in the post-apocalyptic future, think of cars in a futuristic highway that are all equipped with defenses and offensive weaponry. And uh, try just, you know, it's like road rage on crack that's officiated by the government. You know, you're allowed to do these things. And of course, it's great to, It's great science fiction. So the third story is On the Downward Side. And this is almost a divine comedy-like story. It is surrealistic. It is supernatural. It is beautiful. It is romantic. It happens, I believe, in New Orleans... And I, talking about it is almost going to spoil it. And this goes to show that Harlan has a range of capacities to tell any genre in almost any style. And because of this, because there's all these whimsical elements and, and you know, talking animals and, and what have you, it has this fantastical side that you realize, oh, this this is the kind of author you can do. This is the kind of writing you can do if you just go with all these ideas. And it's not to say you just start writing fantasy because you have sentiments towards the romantic. It means that there are ways to do things with some th- certain contexts and with certain normal worlds. So it's kind of like how I was saying before, how there's the world of being and becoming and you're going from one to the other and there's a, a break from normalcy. This is kind of like everything is you're already in that world. 
even though you're saying it's New Orleans, but this it's a whole other veneer. It's a whole other whimsical place to go to. And if you're going to be anything to do with fantasy and you want to get that, that sentimental, sad, almost depressing, personal emotion going, this is a great example to start from if you're telling a, a sort of genre piece regarding mysticism or uh, a divine comedy-like vibe. It's, it's brilliant. It's short. It won't take that long to read. It's one of my favorites, actually, in the book. Okay, the fourth one is O Ye of Little Faith. I think that's the right one. Yeah, it's the fourth one. Okay, so it plays with a the theme of what we were talking about before with belief in gods and how there's people who believe in things and there's people who don't. And he, he wraps that all within the concept of a relationship a man is in with a woman and what that means in, in regards to having people believe in each other. And then it goes into uh, an allegory of, I believe, the the maze and the the Minotaur. The Minotaur and the maze. There's, there's, there's that allegory there as well. And of course, with Harlan Ellison, this is where we have the, the break from normalcy to fantasy. So it's like you're in the normal world and then you get transported to this fantasy world. And in this case, the whole persona, the whole identity of the character has changed, even though he has memories of his previous existence. And it's trying, I think it's trying, I could be wrong, he's trying to see what that relationship is between that man and the woman and what that means to another creature who does not have a belief in that in, in themselves. Like they don't believe in anything and no one believes in them. And that is one of the interesting messages just on the social and interpersonal side of belief as opposed to just the, the fantastical concept of a dream or uh, an ideology uh, that re- that's personified in a god. It has that too, but it's, it's mostly about the, the interpersonal. So I th- it's, a bit, it's a bit awkward. I, I don't really like these styles because it's kind of like, am, am, I, am I in one world and am I in another it's very hard to grasp at times. So it's kind of what you interpret, which is interesting. And to get away with that in, in, a, in a short story, surrealistic fantasy story is pretty cool. Okay, and the fifth one, this is, I think this is very similar to the first one in that regard. And it's, it's sort of not violent, but it's just bizarre. And there's, there's all this, there's like the bizarre element is really strong. So, it, yeah, there is a modern, magical, mystical side to things. And we kind of jump between them as one of the deities is talking to the other person. And he's going to, through all these motions and walking through places. And he's like, I don't know what I'm doing, but you're telling me what to do. And it's this, this weird semblance of, of, I guess it's very similar to the previous story in that regard where it's about a relationship but it's hard to peg that down. So what would a man behave or, or a woman, how would they behave when they're in a certain relationship that is not necessarily one-sided, but it's sort of crazy how you get caught up in a behavior with someone else. And that's not the actual premise. That's just what I think I'm getting out of it and where the, the, uh, the thrust of the story is going. And it's more poetic than it is practical. It's more magical than it is uh, mundane. And trying to wrap your head around it is very difficult. And it's not his most difficult piece in the, in the whole anthology, but it does make you think about passion and, and whimsy. And of course, the, there's other characters in, the, in the, the setting which are just so surreal, even though you, you can relate to them as being contemporary and, and physical like they're not so bizarre but they're so strange it's like okay i can believe that and then you jump immediately to the the whimsical world and you go back to reality so it's one way to treat fantasy in contemporary settings and these are these are kind of a good taste of how the rest of the book is going to go i think it has a lot of violence there's some tech uh great science fiction you got action, you got all kinds of romance, all kinds of sex. 
it's like no holds barred. This is Harlan Ellison, and I totally recommend checking this this story out or these stories out. I'll be coming back doing the other 15. And if you want to be spoiled to a degree, uh, check out the link in my description with Jordan Owen. We reviewed this story or this anthology book uh, years ago. It's fantastic, and it's going to help your, your reading and your writing.